Well, it's great to be here at the end of your conference. It's, uh, I'm sure half of you are on a plane home already, but um, you poor people will get to listen to this. Um, so I want to start with the context, uh, it, and it's a context that we kind of ignore as we go about business as usual, and that is that we are on the, we are on the brink of disaster. And we're on the brink of disaster because we face a world full of interacting complex systems that are going out of control. And they were set in relationship to each other, in interaction with each other, um, and uh, set on a course to go out of control because of one factor, human stupidity. Now, unless we learn how to get smart quickly, there won't be any humans left. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna go through these. Uh, I want to say, though, that in every case, part of the problem is that each of them, if we were to act on them, involve you respecting evidence. And America disdains evidence. To give you one of a billion examples, uh, we have, for 20, 30 years, had people who believe that the higher inequality you have in a society, the better the economy because of a so-called trickle-down economics. Um, there has never been a scintilla of evidence for that. In fact, all the evidence is the higher levels of equality you have in a society, the better the economy. But evidence doesn't matter in America. Now, since this problem is caused by human stupidity, it, we are educators. It was our job not to make people stupider. It was our job to make them smarter. And the first thing I want to say is, given the context of facing disaster, we as educators, but also as people working in colleges and in other institutions, cannot continue to do business as usual. Right? As we continue to do business as usual, we are now contributing to the problem. That's why this little thing at the bottom uh, because of all these changes, many things are dying, and one of them are colleges. And I'm not going to go into that, would be another talk. But your institution will die if you do business as usual. All right, now I want to start with this. Uh, and, and many educators in the United States, this may not be true in other countries, but it's certainly true in the United States. Uh, when I say the word learning, your heart patters. It's just such a nice thing, learning. And when I say teaching, you get all vexed up. Uh, in fact, in a really deep way in America, both the left wing and the right wing hate teachers, or at least they have a love-hate relationship with them. You know, uh, the left wing says, oh, they just don't do anything, leave the kids free, and you're just, anytime you do anything, you're colonizing our kids. And the right wing says, don't let those kids do anything, just skill and drill them and discipline them. You know, both of them are wrong, and both of them fear the teacher. And we have gone as far as we can to deprofessionalize teaching. Uh, that is, to deprofessionalize the one occupation that could make people smart. And I don't think that's accidental, but that would be a political talk, and I'm not going to give that one here. All right, now, I will also say that I've been part of a movement that studied learning out of school, you know, that, that is now mushroomed beyond any control. Uh, MacArthur Foundation, that, where I was funded, spent $88 million doing this because they said, look, we had spent a lot of money on school reform and we got nothing for our buck. Therefore, we want to see how people are learning out of school. And we have this tremendous now romanticization of how kids learn out of school. Uh, you know, when they're in the maker movement or when they're uh, uh, on various affinity spaces or when they're doing game design or when they're doing citizen science. But, you know, we have nobody who spent $88 million. In fact, we have nobody who spent a buck looking at teaching out of school. And yet I want to argue to you that just as out of school learning, so-called informal learning, although I'll tell you it's not that informal anymore out of school, just as informal learning uh, has become ubiquitous now, thanks to technology, so has teaching. Teaching has become ubiquitous out of school. So why, why does no one study that? Why do we study and romanticize the fact that, you know, a five-year-old can learn to hack into the Defense Department system, but uh, there's teaching going on and everything that's involved in that? Now, I also want to say that when we look seriously at teaching out of school, so-called, you know, by the way, the term informal teaching, how many, how, if, if informal learning will get you a lot of hips, 
informal teaching will get you nothing, but what I'm going to be showing you is the modern informal teaching, which, by the way, isn't all that informal anymore. Um, and, uh, and then we can wonder, why does nobody study this? See, I will tell you uh, that out of school now, in the teaching we're going to look at, uh, it, 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 teaching has become about designing learning systems. Teachers are designers, like game designers are designers. They design systems in which people learn. And that, therefore, they are design professionals. All right, now, it's going to be a little route to get there, because what I want to talk about is what would teaching for an imperiled world look like? And how can we begin to think of ourselves as designers of learning systems, of teaching and learning systems, what I'm later going to call distributed systems, rather than business as usual? And to try to get at what real teaching is like, uh, we need to know, first of all, uh, what human memory is like. Uh, because hu the human, in the sense in which a computer has memory, and in the sense in which we often talk about memory as storage of the past, humans have not got memory. This is not a capacity we have. When you store something on a computer and then call it up and use it, you don't change it. It's still on the computer. It is a good veridical storage. But when, you, when humans use a memory of what an experience they've had, every time they use it, they change it. Therefore, that's why I, courtroom uh, eyewitness testimony is miserable. We do not have memory. Therefore, we ought to ask, what capacity have we got? And we, the reason we don't have memory and the reason we keep changing it, which would be stupid for a computer, is that our, for the most part for human beings, long-term memory is where you store the experiences you've had in the world. And you use it to project into the future, not the past. For human beings, memory is future-oriented. Because you have experiences, you store them in your head, and then you use them to get ready for action in the future, right? You say, okay, I've got to do something. I've got to solve a problem. Let me call up some of the stuff I've experienced, see if I can make some good guesses, see if I can simulate in my mind what might happen if I do this, what might happen if I do that, because you don't want to act immediately because it could be dangerous. Uh, and think about it. In evolutionary terms, uh, any, any memory system that w got the past wrong but the future right, made good predictions about how to act, would go on for survival, right? If, if you're getting the future right, you're going to survive. And that's why human memory as a record of the past is so miserable, because we've gotten so good at using it to get ready for action in the future. All right, now later I will tell you, because this is now beginning the theme that we learn by experience, I will tell you that we learn by experience better when the experiences have certain properties that we're in, right? Because the, remember, the key thing is when you're experiencing something, you want to get it into your head as a memory and have it stored in your head in a way that makes it good for future action, good for predicting what will happen, good for making hypotheses about how to act. You want it in there, projected towards the future. All right. now. Uh, so you know, we all, you know, by the way, the old theory of mine that human beings had minds that were like digital computers is completely wrong because, you know, um, human memory is near, long-term memory is nearly infinite. You have to buy extra memory for a computer. No human has ever had to buy extra memory, right? No one has found the limit of how much we can store in experience. Uh, so humans learn from experience. They put the experience, every one they've had, I I as long as we'll see they cared about it, they put it into their head, and then they get ready, they use that for the future. So instead of saying humans learn from experience, we should say it, past experience is used for future learning. So it's not just that you're learning in this experience, you are actually having this experience in large part to be prepared for future learning and new experiences. And as I said, but not only, not any old experience will do, and we'll get to that eventually. All right. now. I've just told you that human beings use experience to learn. And, and I mean by that, they use it to simulate stuff in their mind to get ready to solve problems and, and take action in the future so that they can accomplish things. 
But there is a second thing we use experience for that is equally important, and that is to give meaning to language. So in language, words and phrases have two different types of meanings. They have what you might call system meaning. That is, you know, coffee means some beverage. Uh, democracy means voting. Uh, oligarchy means rule by the rich. I mean, you know, these very general, almost definition-like things is, is language as a system. That will get you nowhere, though, when you're actually speaking. When you speak in context and when you hear, you have to assign what I will call situational meanings to words. That is, you have to assign what do they mean in this situation here and now. And that requires you to have experienced situations like that. Right? So uh, if I say the coffee spill, go get a mop, you have to say that the situational meaning is it's a liquid. The coffee spill, go get a broom. Now you have to say the situational meaning is grains or beans. The coffee spilled, stack it again. Now it must be cans or tens. You see what I mean? In the situation, you have to, you're using your past experiences now to assign uh, specific meanings to words, not general meanings to words. Now, the human capacity to do this is quite creative, right? It is not something that we always do in automatic pilot. So if I say to you, big coffee is as bad, that should be a D. I guess I confused it with another word. Big coffee is as bad as big oil. You can immediately assign a meaning to that, though you've never heard it, right? Something like big corporate greed, uh, you know, duping people and stuff, because you, of all the experiences and the conversations and stuff, you can draw up over big oil, right? You can immediately assign meaning to that. And that, by the way, shows you assigning meaning is an active process. But it also says, and this is very important when you have a kid with a science textbook, for example, that if you have not had experiences in a domain, you cannot assign the specific words to the meaning. Now, to give you an example, I, this I could give a whole talk on. I think it's very interesting in its own right, but we're not going to do it. Let's take language as a system. Well, English has a whole set of words for forms of government, democracy, oligarchy, plutocracy. We have another whole set of words for economic formations, capitalism, socialism, communism. That's the system, right? But when, when a kid has to read something, or when we have to read something, we have to assign a situational meaning that often bears little resemblance to the system meaning. So here is a quote from a very prestigious blog about Milton Friedman. For those of you too young to have known Milty, he was the founder of the Chicago School of Economics, the re one of the great founders of neoliberalism. And while he might or might not have been a nice man, his work gave rise to a great deal of evil. And uh, so here is a quote by somebody who feels differently about Milt that says, I, yet I believe Milton Friedman is right that thoroughgoing restrictions on economic freedom would turn out to be inconsistent with democracy. Now, if, think about it. We take this for granted because we get this sort of academic language and we just presume it must mean something. Democracy at the system means, means that s people vote. E if they vote for representation. That's all it means at the system level. This is saying that uh, uh, democracies couldn't vote to, uh, uh, on economic restrictions on the rich. Now, that's a contradiction because it may, I could see you could say it would be stupid for them to do it. I think it would be quite smart, but th it would be stupid. But how can you say a country, if it voted an economic restriction, was therefore not a democracy when it was voting? See, what I want you to say, this is a contradiction unless you can situate what the word democracy means here. And you cannot situate this meaning unless you have read Milton Friedman and you know the Chicago School and then you know the Brazil School that it gave rise to and you know what it did in South America and you know the debates over it. Then, when you know all that stuff, you can now give a situated meaning just as you did to coffee. Now, for those of you who can't give the proper situated meaning to this, but you'll say, well, I had no trouble with the coffee. That's because you've experienced coffee. Uh, you can't do this because you have not experienced the text, the discussions, and the controversies over the Chicago School, though I will tell you, you have experienced their evil through much of your life. Right. Now, that tells you already, any education that gives this type of text to kids without the experiences of the text and the discussion in the world is immoral. 
Now, this, uh, if you don't believe this, that is, that it is stupid to give people text with no experience, right, because then they have no way to assign situational meanings to the text, no way to use the text for future learning, because they have no experience. All you need to do is, and you can test this any way you want. I learned it when I was uh, starting to play video games 11 years ago. I was in my 50s, uh, and when I played the first game, I was blown away about how hard it was and how bad I was. It was the first time I had been truly bad at something for decades, because of course, like all us old people, I never did anything that I might be bad at, right? I just did what I was well practiced at. And, uh, but like every baby boomer, but unlike any kid, uh, when I was gonna play this game, uh, uh, Deus Ex, I read the manual before I played the game, because I figured that's how you learn, right? And now I had no experience in video games, so I got to experience, what, ex what is it like to be given a text with no experience? Well, I remember reading this text and getting here. It's, it's, all, all, you know, it's a 20-page little booklet with 199 bolded headings with technical definitions cross-referenced to each other. So first of all, it is boring as shit. Um, but I, I, by page five, I could not recall what was on page one. Furthermore, I, and I put this up here because this is where I gave up, uh, I said to myself, this is really amazing because I, I'm an English speaker, I know what every one of those words means, not what, at the system level. But I could not for the life of me figure out what this meant or what in the hell I would do with it, right? And I just remember thinking, this is the m least lucid writing I've ever seen. I just don't get it. How can I play a game I can't even read about? I, what I should have said is, how can I read a text that I haven't played about? And uh, then I went and played the game, played it horribly. At the time, I, I looked much younger. I had a full head of hair. I was a happy person. Um, <laughs> I'm in the home, you know, I'm, you know, I have no addiction to gambling, and so it's so easy to look down on the gamblers, but I have about four other addictions, and it dawned on me as I was coming through the casino, looking down on the gamblers, how comfortable we are with our own addictions. The only ones we can really get, see as bad, are other people's. Um, although this got me over my addiction to texts, I must say. So the thing is, I played this game, played it, Badly, and then I remember having this experience of picking this back up, and I couldn't recover what was hard about it. It was completely lucid, and it wasn't bad, right? Completely lucid. Why? Because now I could assign an image, an action, a goal, dialogue, experience to every word. I could situate their meanings. Furthermore, notice now I could use the text for my own purposes. I'm not going to read it cover to cover. I'm going to say I want to check up on that screen, right? Now it becomes something I can use project for learning to the future. My argument is just as true of this. They're exactly the same. There's a game here. Uh, physics, geology, by the way, do not name bodies of facts. They name activities people do to generate those facts and then to use them in more activities. So if you have not played the game, which is geology, that has done their activities, accomplished their goals, you cannot read this text, and you think it's hard, and you think it's boring, but when you have that experience, you'll, this will just be as lucid and will be good writing, right? This is why, by the way, when you say to scientists, oh, you know, this physics is hard, they say, no, it isn't. You know, it, you know it, because it isn't hard. It's, it's no harder than that game manual if you played the game. Now, if, if you, so the moral of the story is what we do in schools is we give people a bunch of manuals, textbooks, for games they never get to play, and then wonder why we get a bell curve. Because some kids, by the way, have had the experience at home. And then they get to situate the meanings and they look gifted because the test does not distinguish between who had the experiences and therefore are fit to even take the test. Um, now, I told you before, though, that even though experience is crucial, um, it turns out humans are not all that good at using experience for future learning unless the experience has been well designed. And uh, so what are the best types of experiences for humans so that they can store them in their head and really get ready for situating meaning in future action. Well, it turns out, I'm gonna define this notion of experience good for learning. 
that is. I'm going to tell you, just sending your kid out to the door, just pushing the kid out the door uh, all by himself is in, so he can have an experience of getting mugged or something uh, is not necessarily good for learning. It's got to be designed in a certain way. The, the experiences that humans learn, by, by the way, the, the, the evidence for this is in work on embodied cognition, situated cognition. First of all, if humans learn best when they're an experience that they have a goal and an action they have to take. Why? Because that focuses them on how to pay attention to the experience. So if there's no action to take, no goal, humans don't store the experience very well. It is crucial that the outcome of the action matters to them, that it's at stake. This is a fundamental principle now in neuroscience that when you're having an experience and something's at stake, it, something matters, you've colored that experience with affect and emotion, you process it in two different ways simultaneously through your higher cortex and through things like the amygdala that put an emotional coloring on it. And when you have that emotional coloring, that when you care in that way, you integrate that information, that experience as you store it in your head with the, with the rest of your experience in a much deeper, tighter, better networked way that you can use for the future. So, by the way, everything I say in my talks e e can be used two ways. You can either use it to make things better or you can use it to make it worse because if you wanted to really make people stupid, first of all, give them texts with no games and second of all, give them experiences with no goals, no action and be certain they don't give a shit about it, right? And then you can make them stupider and, you know, you can make money both ways. All right, um, now, one of the ways to put this differently uh, that it, and because now this gets down to designing a curriculum, is if you want to create those, that sort of experience is good for learning, what you're really going to do is you're going to create what I call the probe circuit. It's what's been called the cycle of reflective action. Donald Schoen, the guy in Reflective Practitioners, has talked about this, so have uh, a lot of other people. In the, this circuit, which is the circuit where humans think best, it is the circuit where they learn best, it's how we create experiences good for learning. You have to have a goal, and then you have to simulate in your mind what you have to get ready for action. You don't act immediately, because the, therefore the goal has to be something that's not trivial. And you say, okay, what if I did this? What if I did that? What'll happen? Like, you know, what happens if in the toast I insult the bride? Okay, you know, oh, no, I'm not gonna do that. You know, you get ready for action. You have to care, but then you act. You make a hypothesis, you act, and then the crucial thing, this is the most crucial thing, when you act, you must sit and say, what did the world say back? Was that a good result? Oh, maybe I should keep going. Was that a bad result? Maybe I should do something different. Was it a disastrous result? Maybe I should rethink my goal. Or was it indifferent? You have to appreciate or assess the action. And then, based on that assessment, you, you probe again. See, I, I say this because this is a conversation with the world that says, if you don't pay attention to the world and appreciate its response, it'll bite you. And this is what it was happening in America. We have a society that does not listen to the world's response, and we're getting bitten and bitten and bitten. Now, the thing is, if you have to appreciate, if, you are, if you're trying to garden, or you're trying to do an experiment in science, or you're trying to do anything, where does your appreciative capacity come from? Where did you get the value system that said that's a good result, that's a bad result, that's an indifferent result? Well, obviously, you didn't invent it. You got it from the social groups and the teachers you had. What we are doing when we teach anything is we are telling the person how to appreciate the responses from the world, how to assess them. We are giving them taste, good taste in science, good taste in literature, good taste in gardening, good taste in government. We're saying, what's a goal worth accomplishing? What's a, what are the experiences you need to be able to make good hypotheses of how to proceed? But how do you appreciate the response from the world so that you proceed to make things better and not worse? All right. So I've, uh, this dual that experience is used to prepare for future learning and it's used to situate the meaning of words uh, are actually connected. Because if you think about it, 
I cannot learn anything without having some way to represent it, some language to talk about it, some language to think about it. And yet, having a language to think and talk is worthless if it's not leading to actions in the world, right? So they're actually married with each other. Now, all of that is just the preamble to say, uh, when you take that perspective on learning and teaching, then you actually can go out into the world and see that this is already being done beautifully, right? So take, for example, Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh is 10,000 cards. It's a card game uh, that can be played on um, computers or played face to face. You can go on websites that will coach you, teach you, uh, give you fact guides, uh, tutorials to learn it. And Yu-Gi-Oh is just like us educators. It faces the problem that it has a technical language uh, that nobody in their right mind would want to read unless they had deep caring and had lots of experience. And the Yu-Gi-Oh! company says, I got 10,000 cards. You can't play the game if you can't read the cards because the card tells you what to do. Um, and, uh, I, I, and nobody's going to buy these 10,000 cards as a textbook. Uh, nobody, nobody's going to read the rule book as a textbook. So I have got to actually give them a game, situated meanings. Right, now just to convince you that this language is no better than physics or no better than, uh, when this card is summoned, uh, by the way, this is a card is classificatory too. You gotta really be able to deal with class 10,000 of them. Uh, when this card is summoned, activate one of these effects. Target one equipped card equipped to a monster on the field, destroy that target. Target one equipped card equipped to a monster on the field, equip that target to this card. Is this fun? How many of you think that would help you play the game? That you would know what to do when you, you have to, that's telling you what to do when the cards are all laid out in a very specific way. Now, people, uh, there are textbooks here because people sometimes argue over the, almost in a Talmudic way, over what the, these are seven-year-olds, uh, over what the rules mean. Um, and so then they go to the official rule book and they read stuff like this. Uh, in order to psycho summon a psycho monster, you need one tuner. Look for the tuner next to its type. The tuner monster and other face up monsters you use for the psycho summon are called psycho material monsters. The sum of their levels is the level of psycho monster you can summon. Now, here's the problem uh, no, anybody who wants to play Yu Gi Oh! cares can play it. I took that card off a seven year old. Nobody has ever said the Yu-Gi-Oh language is too hard, and no kid who's playing it has obviously, see, there's no reason to test the kid on whether he knows the language, because if he's playing the game and winning, he couldn't have done it without knowing the language, right? You know, good learning does not require tests. You only need tests when you designed your learning badly. And I, you know, when I w was writing about this, and I took, you know, I took a number of cards off for two seven-year-olds, um, I it was said to them, you know, because not only are they reading this stuff and playing, but they're arguing over it uh, in terms of linguistic matters. And I said, you know, it's really amazing to me. Do you realize how complex the language you are reading and talking is? And they looked at me like I was a complete idiot. And they said, it's not hard at all. They couldn't see it as complex. Why? Because it actually had, just like the game manual, I don't, I don't consider the language of theoretical syntax hard. I spent 10 years reading it. Most other people would rather have their toenails pulled out than read it, right? What I'm saying is no language is hard and nobody could fail a test in a language for which they had situated meaning. So if you want to get a bell curve, you've got to be sure that a majority of the people in the class had never played the game. All right, now, uh, when, in, when you have companies like Yugi or games or anything else, and you want thousands of people to pay you money to play them, and you have got language that complicated, and you've got systems that complicated, you better be designing good teaching and good learning. So I'm gonna take one example of, of how a modern, what I'm gonna call distributed teaching and learning system looks like. One example only, it's gonna be a game, but my point is not about games, as I will see, because you can, the, the, I'm gonna say to you that the game is used to create a problem space, that is, problems to be solved. It's what I'll call the seed. The seed could be many other problem spaces. It does not have to be a game. Games can be good for this, but you can use other things. So I'm gonna take Dota 2. It's a competitive multiplayer fighting game. 
Uh, it's a strategy game in which teams of people have to handle multiple characters, there's hundreds of them, uh, and uh, it's quite complicated, so they have the problem that how is anybody gonna learn it? And uh, here's uh, an example of, uh, you know, uh, where a guy, he's got a site helping people to learn, and he's saying, you know, it takes a lot of learning because there's 100 characters, and you have to know how each behaves, you gotta pick five, you got another team, so. I, here's, here's a, I have a student, Jeff Holmes, his th a thesis will come out soon. He is studying in detail these distributed teaching systems. Um, and what you will see uh, when you go to Dota 2 if, it is you can make a big mistake, and that is you can think the game's the game. You say, okay, here's the software. It's on their computer. That's where all the action is. Well, I will tell you most of the action is not there. What these people do is all the players and the company get a passion for Dota and they create a whole bunch of sites and affinity spaces and they get together and they do stuff and you get what Jeff calls design learning. That is, this is didactic. They design their own guides, their own fact sheets, their own tutorials. Some of these tutorials are lectures from eight-year-olds. They don't say, oh, uh, lecturing is death. Lecturing is uh, imperializing people. They say, here's my, you, because you want a lecture, you get it. You want a, a coach, you get it. You want a fact sheet. Now that's all designed. The, the kids, the people, a, and the company both are designing instruction, available all over. Then there's um, emergent places where you go and learning and teaching happens on the spot. So you, there's a site where you can just spectate on other people's games to see what's going on, and in some cases they can be annotated, right? Uh, you can go to sites that give you builds for your heroes, and, and you know, then you can look how to do it. You, Twitch TV allows you to watch other people's games with commentary that tells you why they're doing what they're doing. There's forums in which you can ask any question, and anybody who knows the answer then becomes the teacher. And then, of course, there's theory crafting where groups of people to get together and try to understand the underlying statistics of the game so they can modify it and uh, make stuff for the game. And then he's a, another set of things called, uh, that he calls design for emergent teaching. That is the coaching mode where you can go on a site and get a coach. And the coach will come into the game. This is another player you know, higher level than you, who comes in and directly coaches you while you're in there, right? Now, this is just a tiny, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh has this, all of these things have this, a proliferation of things that are, people are building instructional tools, people are going to sites where they can get emergent teaching and learning, or they are actually going on places where they can design their own teacher, get a coach, tell them what you want, do that. Uh, it's the whole full gamut. So, this is a distributed teaching and learning system because it, teaching is all over it and of all different kinds. And it's bottom up as much as top down. Sometimes you're the teacher, sometimes you're the learner. Some people, like the game designers, are in some sense always teachers, but they're designing not just to teach themselves, but to get the learners to teach, to make. It's a distributed system. It's not in a classroom. It's not only in, by the way, this is, this, the, there are, people are face to face as well. They can go face to face and also in competition and anything else. It's a distributed system. So what I wanna argue is we've had all this controversy about how do we transform colleges and schools when we still think within the box of either a classroom or insipid e-learning where we turn the, our lectures into e-learning. When in fact out there in the world, uh, the the people with passions for problem solving in various domains are thinking of teaching as designing and resourcing a distributed uh, teaching and learning system. Uh, you know, a game, the, the Dota people think of themselves as how am I designing a system that both top down and bottom up through multiple places and opportunities customized to some choices you make, uh, you will be able to get an emergent system of people teaching and learning each other. Right? And these systems give rise to not only powerful knowledge, but also a tremendous amount of modding, making, and designing by the participants. All right, so the game is just the seed. The seed just has to be a well-designed problem space. Right, that is where this probe cycle is triggered. Right? It could be on media, it could be in a classroom, it could be in a field. It has to be well-designed though. You're the teacher. You've got to design a good problem space. 
Um, there can be other seeds, but there needs to be a seed. There needs to be goals, actions, and caring. All right, so here are some of the ways in which these distributed systems teach. Right? They use facts as tools for problem solving. They, not, you, they don't use them as the content. They give information just in time and on demand. They lower the risk of failure. They sequence the problems well. They don't just, it, it, this is called level design. Uh, they manage attention so that you don't get overwhelmed. They assess growth, not what, they don't tell you how, they don't say you got an F on Tuesday, it's all over. They look at how you're growing on multiple variables across time. They encourage you to think of the thing as a complicated system. Uh, they distribute teaching and learning, as I've said, they encourage making and modding and designing even on the part of the learners, and they create collective intelligence. They do ways that people collaborate so they can be smarter than the smartest person in the group, not that they can be uh, like a committee, stupider than the stupidest person in the group. All right, so um, I think you've got the point. Let me say that, uh, finish with this example, uh, because uh, here is a thing called Fold It. And, you know, this is made by a group of scientists uh, who uh, are in protein folding. And uh, protein science is very crucial because everything in your body is done by proteins, good and bad. They can kill you or they can help you, but they do it all. And uh, the trouble with proteins is they're just made of chemicals and it's not too hard to know what chemicals are in them, even though there could be hundreds. The trouble is that for each protein, the chemicals fold into a 3D, almost origami type of shape. And when you've got several hundred or thousand chemicals in a protein, there are billions of shapes it could have folded into. But if you want to know its effect and how to manipulate it, you've got to find the shape it actually folds into, which is its lowest energy state. So the way this science is conducted is through supercomputers who try to just churn through, you know, bill, you know, it's, it's, you know, millions and hope to get the right one. So they had the idea. Could we put everyday people, that is not scientists, uh, together in some way that their, the human pattern recognition could uh, compete with the computer? And so you get this game folded that has a nice little graphic representation of how to fold these proteins. And every time you, you, know, you try a fold, you get, it go, if it's the low energy state for that site, it'll turn blue. And you try to see if you can find a pattern to go through and get the thing into that state um, and what happens when you put this up is people do, they distribute a teaching and learning system just like you saw. They go on sites and they start teaching each other some chemistry. They form guilds, they write tutorials, they get a forum. All of that stuff begins to proliferate uh, because uh, individual people, you know, don't necessarily have a, you know, you, you can do okay, but you're not going to probably find uh, any new information, but when these people start getting the distributed help and sharing and doing wisdom of the crowd stuff, then they really hum. And uh, in contests with the scientists uh, in the last uh, time that I'm aware of, you know, where the scientists bring their supercomputers and try to see if who can find the proper fold for an unknown protein, uh, they, the players won seven of the top ten slots. Uh, they've published two articles in Nature. The articles have the longest set of authors in history. And a, a year ago, they, um, a, a guild discovered the proper fold for the protein that causes AIDS, which has eluded science for 20 years. None of these people have degrees. None of them are stupid because they're in collective intelligence. And they, they, none of them had a chemistry degree, but they were in school and they had a teacher. It was a distributed teaching and learning system designed in the beginning by game designers and scientists, but ultimately that design evolves like, a, like an evolutionary thing to find a, 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 the site where it really creates collective intelligence. If we could stop doing business as usual and get out and do this where it counts, then uh, we have the time to save ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>